Right friends, welcome back to main events of 12th week. Let us look at the important events. Cabinet clears Rs 81,975 crore. Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Grameen over a period of 3 years, it plans to construct 1 crore houses in rural areas during the next 3 years. Then other important cabinet decisions, one of the important cabinet decisions pertains to Ashkabat agreement. This assumed significance in view of the proposed development of Chabahar port in Iran by India. Then if you look at the events around the world, historic visit of Barack Obama to Cuba. This visit by any American president took place after 88 years. Calvin Coolidge was the previous president in the year 1928 to visit Cuba. And we are going to deliberate on major differences or sticky points between Cuba and United States of America. Then Turkey and European Union struck a deal on migrants. Then another important aspect is the historic visit of K.P. Sharma Oli, the Prime Minister of Nepal to China. And whenever they face a problem with India, they try to tilt towards China. We are going to discuss what is the outcome of Nepalese Prime Minister's visit to China. Then Syrian government regains Palmyra, the world historic site from Islamic State. And we are going to discuss on reasons for major gains by Bashar al-Assad government in Syria in recent times. Right friends, let us look at the domestic event. The first and the foremost is cabinet clears Rs 81,975 crore. Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Grameen over 3 years and you can say it is replacement of Indira Awas Yojana which is in existence for the past several years and what are the changes made in comparison to Indira Awas Yojana we are going to deliberate in this and please do not forget the Prime Minister's vision or you can say the present government's vision is to have housing for all by 2022 not only housing housing with the water connection, toilet facilities and 24-7 electricity supply. For that, a technical group was commissioned by the centre and it estimated a shortfall of 2 crore houses in urban areas and 4 crore houses in rural areas. By 2022, for each and every family to have house, the housing shortfall was calculated as 2 crore houses in urban areas and 4 crore houses in rural areas. That means total shortfall will be 6 crore houses and as per the KPMG estimates, the housing shortfall is going to be 11 crore houses. Anyhow, government's calculations put the figure at 6 crore houses and the government announced Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana for urban areas previously. Now government came up with Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana for rural areas. I have given the points. They will be implemented in all the rural areas except Delhi and Chandigarh. Then it provides assistance for construction of 1 crore houses in rural areas over a period of 3 years that is from 2016-17 to 2018-19. And another important aspect is the cost will be shared by the central government and states in the ratio of 60-40 in plain areas and at 90-10 in northeastern states and hilly states. Right? If you look into the other aspects, unit assistance will be Rs. 1,20,000 per each house in plain areas and Rs. 1,30,000 in hilly states, then difficult areas and IAP districts. You may ask what is IAP district? IAP districts are integrated action plan districts for tribal areas or for backward districts, certain districts are nominated under integrated action plan and for those areas also at par with hilly areas, difficult areas, rupees 1,30,000 will be given and for plain areas assistance will be rupees 1,20,000. Another important deviation from Indira Awas Yojana is under Indira Awas Yojana the assistance used to be 
around 70,000 and 75,000. Then how to identify the beneficiaries? Socio-economic and caste census popularly known as SECC 2011 will be used for identification of beneficiaries and Gram Sabha will take the final decision in identifying the beneficiaries. And another important aspect is at the national level, National Technical Support Agency will be created to provide technical support to the states for its implementation. Then one more important aspect is for meeting the additional fund requirement, borrowing will be done from NABARD to the tune of rupees 21,975 crore rupees. So this is another major difference in comparison to Indira Avas Yojana challenges, there are some challenges. The assessed figures for housing shortfall by 2022 are at variance with the figures released by various agencies. As I have already told you, KPMG put the figure at 11 crores for both urban and rural areas put together, whereas the government figure is 6 crore houses. And ensuring water connection and 24-7 electricity connection are the biggest challenges. But government came up with action plan with regard to 24-7 electricity supply as per the statement given by Piyush Goyal. All the villages will be connected with electricity by the year 2018, specifically by May 1. And recently he stated all the houses will have electricity connection by 2019. If we are to believe the statement of Piyush Goyal, each and every house will have electricity connection and the real challenge is to have water connection in rural areas because some of the villages are water stressed and finding even drinking water is difficult in some villages. Look into the next issue, land may be problem in some villages and cooperation from states is the most difficult problem because of funds constraints with some states because for plain areas the central government will give 60 percent and state governments have to bear 40 percent. Right friends, these are the challenges for implementation of PMAY Gramin but anyhow it is the step in the right direction. If you look at the other cabinet decisions, reduction in subsidy rates of nutrients in P and K fertilizers around 25 percent reduction for nitrogen and phosphorus nutrients. This is in tune with the falling prices across the world and please do not forget the fertilizer subsidy except urea is based on nutrients. Nutrient based subsidy or NBS popularly known as for the fertilizers every year government announces the subsidy for various macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium etc. So this year the subsidy is reduced by 25 percent. Then procurement of launch services for GSAT 11 spacecraft at 1117 crores. You may ask what is GSAT 11? GSAT 11 is the communication satellite to provide high bandwidth VSAT communication and the cabinet also gave its approval for hosting of under 17 football world cup next year and total cost would be around 95 crores. Another important decision of cabinet is approval for India to exit to the Ashkabat agreement. What is meant by Ashkabat agreement? Ashkabat agreement is international transport and transit corridor to facilitate transportation of goods between Central Asia and Persian Gulf. It was conceptualized in 2011. All of you are well aware Persian Gulf has got high petroleum reserves and the intention of Ashkabat agreement is to connect the interiors of Central Asia with the Persian Gulf for easy transportation. This assumed significance for India because of the reason India is going to develop Chabahar port in Iran. Please look into this slide. Chabahar port is situated in Iran and Pakistan's Gwadar port will be developed by China. And India is planning to develop Chabahar port. Once Chabahar port is developed, then India can have access to Central Asia and acceding to Ashkabat agreement so as to become a member of this transit agreement is the right step for India because of Chabahar port development. Right? If you want more about Ashkabat agreement, the founding members are Oman, Iran, 
Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. By the way, Ashgabat is the capital of Turkmenistan and India has to approach Turkmenistan to become member of Ashgabat agreement because Turkmenistan is the depository state. So, as I have already told you, with accession, India will have access to Central Asia and as India is going to develop Chabahar port, this is going to be the important milestone for India as far as transit to Central Asia is concerned. Right friends, so these are the domestic issues if you look at the issues around the world. The first and the foremost issue is Obama visits Cuba. Efforts to normalize relations between these two countries started somewhere around December 2014. Then first face to face meeting between Obama and Raul Castro held in Panama. Then subsequently America removed Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Subsequently embassies were opened in Havana and Washington. Then ban was lifted on Cuban financial transactions going through United States of America banks. Then approves first US factory in Cuba since 1959 revolution and both the countries struck an agreement to restore commercial flights and first ferry service between US and Cuba was also agreed and please look into this slide this Cuba and USA are quite close. In fact, the distance between Miami in Florida and Havana is not much. Please look into this slide. And now Americans can travel independently to Cuba and under these circumstances or keeping this as the background, US President Barack Obama's visit to Cuba assumed significance and Obama met Cuban President Raul Castro but not met Fidel Castro. All of you are well aware, previous weeks we discussed relations between US and Cuba. Fidel Castro is instrumental in the revolution in Cuba which occurred in the year 1959 and Obama spoke to anti-government activists as well as he met entrepreneurs and he also addressed through television from historic theatre where Calvin Coolidge spoke in 1928. Right, as I have already told you, Calvin Coolidge was the last president to visit Cuba in the year 1928. Right friends, so let us look at the differences between these two countries. There are still some sticky points between these two countries in spite of the visit of Barack Obama. First and the foremost is after 1959 revolution, Cuba confiscated the assets of United States of America and subsequently United States of America imposed a trade embargo and US Congress approval is required to remove this trade embargo and getting the approval of US Congress is difficult. Then second important point is US migration policy with regard to Cubans is another point of concern for Cubans. As per 1966 Cuban Adjustment Act, Cubans are getting permanent residency very fast. That means Cuban citizens are getting permanent residency in United States of America very fast and this is the sore point between these two countries and Cuba wants for its removal. Then another important sticky point is with regard to the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. This Guantanamo Bay Naval Base is in the news recently. And if you go into history, United States of America got this 45 square mile base in the year 1903 for around $4,000 lease. And after September 11 attacks in 2001, United States of America established a detention center for terror suspects at Guantanamo Bay. And there is a lot of pressure to close this in recent times because these terror suspects are being sent to detention center established in Guantanamo Bay and Cuba wants return of this territory. This is another sticky point. Then good relations enjoyed by Cuba with socialist countries Venezuela, Bolivia is another point of soaring relations between capitalist America and socialist Cuba. And Cuba opposes US broadcaster Marti. You may ask what is Marti? 
This is the US broadcasting station that is radio and TV broadcaster established by United States of America in the name of Joe Smarty. Joe Smarty was the revolutionary of Cuba who belongs to 19th century and this radio station broadcasts from United States of America. This is funded by United States of America. Cuba wants US to stop this propaganda or the television and radio programs. Then another important sticky point between USA and Cuba is Cuba's human rights record is very poor and treatment to political dissidents in Cuba is another area of concern for United States of America. So these are the sticky points. Let us hope in due course of time these sticky points are going to be settled and let us move on to the next issue. Turkey and the European Union struck a deal on migrants. Migrants became the biggest issue for European Union. Several differences cropped up between the European Union countries and all of you are well aware. Civil war in Syria started in the year 2011 and last year in the year 2015 alone migrants to Greece crossed 1 million or 10 lakhs. This Greece islands are very close to Turkey and people travel through Aegean Sea. Please look into this slide. This is Aegean Sea. This is situated between Greece and Turkey and several Greece islands are situated in Aegean Sea. This Aegean Sea is the extension of Mediterranean Sea, you can say. And people are traveling through boats and reaching Greece. And there are several differences cropped up between various countries of European Union. And under these circumstances, this deal between Turkey and European Union assumed significance. From March 20, all the irregular migrants crossing Turkey to Greece will be sent back to Turkey. And please don't forget, Turkey is home to around 3 million Syrian refugees, the highest in any country. And for each Syrian sent back to Turkey, a Syrian migrant will be resettled in European Union. Then nationals of Turkey will have access to the Schengen passport free zone by June 2016. You may ask what is Schengen passport free zone? This is the grouping of around 26 countries where single passport is enough to travel across 26 countries. Then fourth one is to help the migrants, European Union committed additional financial aid of 3 billion euro. And both sides agreed to re-energize Turkey's bid to join the European Union. Right friends, so this is the essence of the deal struck. Right? Another important aspect, historic visit of K.P. Sharma Oli to China. And in this week's news analysis, we discussed about downturn in India-Nepal relations. Please don't forget, please listen to that. Then. K.P. Sharma Oli visited China and there was a history whenever Nepal runs into problem with India, that country will look at China for assistance. It occurred several times in the past and important developments after the visit of K.P. Sharma Oli to China, I listed three points, one and two are very important. First one is agreement on transit through China. Nepal is getting at present supplies through India. India is well connected with the routes through plain areas, but China is something different because it is connected through highest mountainous ranges ranging above 6000 meters. And agreement on transit through China, where China agreed to provide the Tianjin seaport for transit of Nepali goods. At present, Nepal is getting goods from Haldia port in West Bengal. And this uh, Tianjin port is situated in China and agreement on transit was reached between these two countries. Second one is regarding connectivity of Nepal through rail network in Tibet. Both the sides will exchange ideas on constructing cross-border railways as soon as possible. And the third point is uh, MOUs or agreements on energy exploration and storage, banking, scholarships and training. One and two are most important and what are the difficulties in ensuring one and two I have listed out here as critical appraisal about transit through China. If at all Nepal wants to get its goods through Tianjin port, 
there is nothing wrong but see the difficulty tianjin port is situated 3000 kilometers from nepal whereas haldia port is hardly 1000 kilometers away and hence the transit of goods through china costs a lot for nepal whether nepal is ready for the costs is the biggest question then second important point is railway network through himalayas and it entails a huge expenditure it also takes time because the railway network in china that is in tibet up to the nepal border will come up only by 2020 so it is time consuming effort not only that it entails high expenditure is the nepal in a position to bear the expenditure is the moot question and another important point is china may not be in a position to finance such projects on easier terms because of the reason china itself is into problems because of its dwindling foreign exchange reserves major job cuts slowing growth rates under these circumstances these two points it is not easy to meet right friends look at the last and the most important aspect is syrian government regains the palmyra from islamic state islamic state occupied this territory of palmyra in may 2015 and now the syrian government led by bashar al assad recaptured this historic city of palmyra it is a major victory for bashar al assad government it is made possible because of combined efforts of russian air strikes and ground forces of syrian government and islamic state seized this historic city in may 2015 and if you want more about this world historic city it is palmyra it is the oasis in the syrian desert it contains monumental ruins of great city world heritage site and please don't forget the world heritage sites are declared by paris based unesco united nations cultural wing then one of the most important cultural centers of the ancient world it is necropolis with more than 500 tombs what is meant by necropolis necropolis is the place where large number of tombs are situated so it is necropolis and art and architecture of palmyra is of first and second centuries and these combine greek or roman architecture with persian influences historic temples like bel temple bal shaman temple arch of triumph are situated in this historic place and as per the news reports several of these structures were destroyed by is unesco also expressed its concern after the destruction of these structures I have given the pictures prior to the destruction. Please look into these pictures: Temple of Baal, Baal Shaman Temple, and Arch of Triumph. Now, before closing this lecture, let us look at the reasons for major gains by Bashar al-Assad government in Syria. I have listed out five reasons. First one is as the cessation of hostility started with the major opposition. There are three prominent groups. One is government group. second one is major opposition groups third one is is as a cessation of hostilities started between government and opposition now the government forces concentrated more on destroying islamic state second one is russian air strikes combined with the syrian ground forces made these gains possible and third most important point is destruction of oil routes through smuggling by russian air strikes dented the revenue for is previously there were several smuggling routes of selling oil by is especially towards turkey and these routes were dismantled by russia with its air strikes so is income was dented that is the main reason then fourth important point is syrian government needs a major victory at this juncture so as to have more bargaining power in geneva peace talks that is the fourth important reason and the last one is in view of several bomb blasts in turkey turkey sealed its border with syria at some locations and that choked the transit routes of supplying arms and ammunition to isis so these are the five main reasons why bashar al assad government gained major territories in recent times right friends with this let us conclude lecture part and 
please do listen to science and technology and the news analysis in news analysis we deliberated on downturn in the relations of uh, india nepal and upturn in the relations between india and bangladesh right friends have a nice day thank you